about that is what I am calling. So if you have not already and ring that notification bell so that you never miss a comment section or an off the clock episode. We're making videos like this episode came about, but anyway, let's just dive in. You're not gonna feed into this stuff, but still, we're talking to women today. Okay, here we go. So that's and if Christ be not risen, then is our preaching vain, and your faith is also vain. There is a general consensus among biblical scholars and historians concerning the resurrection of Jesus. The minimal facts approach presents data that is strongly evidenced and granted by virtually all scholars on the subject, even the sceptical ones. First things first, what is this method? Yep. The approach is advanced by a man named Gary Habermas. Quote, From the outset of my studies, I argued that there were at least two major prerequisites for an occurrence to be designated as a minimal fact. Each event had to be established by more than adequate scholarly evidence, and usually by several critically ascertained independent lines of argumentation. Additionally, the vast majority of contemporary scholars in relevant fields had to acknowledge the historicity of the occurrence. Of the two criteria, I have always held that the first is by far the most crucial, especially since this initial requirement is the one that actually establishes the historicity of the event. Besides, the acclamation of scholarly opinion may be mistaken or it could change. Throughout this research, I have produced two lists of facts that have varied slightly in the numbering from publication to publication. The longer list was usually termed the known historical facts and typically consisted of a dozen historical occurrences that more generally met the above criteria, but concerning which I was somewhat more lenient on their application. This would apply especially to the high percentages of scholarly near unanimous agreement that I would require for the shorter list. From this longer list, I would extrapolate a briefer lineup of from four to six events termed the minimal facts. Okay, so what are these minimal facts? Minimal fact one, Jesus died by crucifixion by the order of Pontius Pilate. Pontius. Pontius. Minimal fact two, the disciples claimed to have seen the risen Jesus. Minimal fact three, Paul converted from an antagonist of Christianity to an apologist for Christianity after having claimed an experience with the risen Jesus. Minimal fact four, James also, otherwise known as James the brother of Jesus, who was initially a skeptic, converted to Christianity after having an an experience with the risen Jesus. And minimal fact five, the empty tomb. So, Lego. Minimal fact one, the best attested fact of the historical Jesus is his death by crucifixion under Pilate. Not only is the account of the crucifixion included in all four gospels, it is also confirmed by several non-Christian sources. Jewish historian Josephus, Roman historian Tacitus, Greek satirist Lucian of Samosata, the Jewish Talmud, Jesus's crucifixion meets the historical criteria of multiple independent early eyewitness sources, including enemy attestation. John Dominic Croissant, 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 who is a non-Christian critical scholar and co-founder of the Jesus Seminar. He says, that he was crucified is as sure as anything historical can ever be. Croissant. Now, if you don't care about this, if you don't think it's compelling that there is a consensus among biblical and historical scholars concerning the early movement of the church or the early beliefs of the church. Biblical and historical scholars that are both Christian and non-Christian, then you do not understand or you do not care to acknowledge why or how we know anything about anything 
from the past. Minimal fact two, there is virtual consensus among scholars who study Jesus' resurrection that subsequent to Jesus' death by crucifixion, his disciples really believed that he appeared to them, risen from the dead. All the Gospels present Jesus as risen. And perhaps the most important biblical creed out there that supports the resurrection is in 1 Corinthians 15. We'll have a look at it in the next minimal fact concerning Paul's conversion. A multitude of other creeds exist in the New Testament that support the resurrection of Jesus. Clement of Rome, a first century Christian who apparently knew the apostles of the Lord, wrote, Christ therefore was sent forth by God and the apostles by Christ. Both these appointments then were made in an orderly way according to the will of God, having therefore received their orders and being fully assured by the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ and established in the word of God with full assurance of the Holy Ghost, they went forth proclaiming that the kingdom of God was at hand. Clement, therefore, provides additional evidence of the appearances to Jesus' followers. There is no dispute among scholars that the disciples experienced something. The disciples not only really proclaimed that Jesus was raised, they sincerely, sincerely believed in the resurrection, as demonstrated by their transformed lives. Eleven early sources testify to the willingness of the apostles to suffer horrendously and die for what they knew was true. Luke, Paul, Josephus, Clement of Rome, Clement of Alexandria, Polycarp, Ignatius, Dionysius of Corinth, Tertullian, Oregon, and Hegesippus. Hegesippus. For example, we know extra biblically that Jesus' brother, or brother, James was stoned to death by the Sanhedrin and that Paul was beheaded in Rome under Nero. Many will die for what they believe to be true, but no one willingly suffers and dies for a known lie. Liars make poor martyrs. Further, making a comparison between them and modern-day martyrs is a false comparison. It is a false analogy. Modern martyrs act solely out of their trust in beliefs that were taught to them. The apostles, however, died holding to their own personal testimony of what they saw. So another way to put it is this. Contemporary martyrs die for what they believe to be true. The disciples of Jesus died for what they knew to be either true or false. As with the crucifixion and the empty tomb, the post-resurrection appearances meet the criteria of multiple independent and early eyewitness sources, as well as the testimony of former enemy of Christianity, Saul of Tarsus turned Paul. The evidence makes certain that on separate occasions, different individuals and groups had experiences of seeing Jesus risen from the dead bodily. This conclusion is virtually indisputable, therefore undisputed. Minimal fact three, Saul of Tarsus turned Saint Paul. Paul, a well-educated Jew, said that he had lived According to the strictest party of our religion, I have lived as a Pharisee. Paul even said that he was circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law, a Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness under the law, Blameless. Sounds like a stand-up guy. Yet something happened to Paul that caused him to become a Christian. <laughs> Instead of persecuting the church, he became an advocate, an apologist for the church. Why? Well, he experienced something. He experienced the risen Jesus. 
Paul's transformation is well documented, reported by Paul himself, as well as Luke, Clement of Rome, Polycarp, Tertullian, Dionysus of Corinth, and Oregon. Therefore, we have early, multiple, and first-hand testimony that Paul converted from being a staunch opponent of Christianity to one of its greatest proponents. The evidence is also found in the establishment of several churches by Paul. For this reason, Paul's conversion, after having seen the risen Jesus, is a minimal fact. Further, Paul recounts what biblical scholars recognise as an early Christian creed. A creed dating to within a few years after the crucifixion of Jesus. 1 Corinthians 15 verses 3 to 8. Notice the creedal nature and the repetitive structure. For when I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received in which also you stand, that Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day, according to the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve, after that he appeared to more than 500 brethren at one time, most of whom remain until now, but some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles, and last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared to me also. Notice also that three of the minimal facts are present in this creed. Death of Jesus, empty tomb, post-mortem appearances. Several indicators in this text confirm this to be an early Christian creed. The passage uses stylized wording and parallel structure common to creedal formula. You also have the Greek words delivered and received. That's, let's have a go, paradidomi for delivered and paralambanomi for received. These words correspond to technical rabbinical terms for the transmission of sacred tradition. Paul is reminding the church in Corinth that he had previously passed on to them some sacred tradition, sacred tradition that he himself received no later than AD 35 or 36. So that's about two to six years after the crucifixion of Jesus, depending upon when one dates the crucifixion. Either way, it's very early. And as far as historical evidence goes, that is incredible. The creed also contains non-Pauline traits, indicating that the creed does not originate with Paul, rather that it comes from another source, a source that used phrases like for our sins, on the third day, according to the scriptures, the twelve, he has been raised, and he was seen. The creed has parallelisms in the text to make memorization easier. So the first and third lines are longer and they have the same grammatical construction. And fourth, the creed probably originated in Jerusalem from eyewitnesses. The Greek text contains Semitisms showing a Palestinian influence, like the use of the Aramaic Cephas instead of the Greek Peter. As well, the Jerusalem church controlled the doctrine of the church that even Paul himself submitted to, making the Jerusalem church the source of the creed. And Paul travelled to Jerusalem with Peter and James. New Testament scholar and sceptic Gerd Ludeman assigns this passage a very early date. The elements in the tradition are to be dated to the first two years after the crucifixion of Jesus, not later than three years. The formation of the appearance traditions mentioned in 1 Corinthians 15, 3 to 8, falls into the time between 30 and 33 CE. The early date rules out the possibility of legendary myth development. It is simply not a plausible explanation, if you were going to make such a suggestion, which is a common objection. The early day also demonstrates that the disciples began preaching his resurrection early. It wasn't a later invention. Christian philosopher and theologian J.P. Morland elaborates, 
He says, there was simply not enough time for a great deal of myth and legend to accrue and distort the historical facts in any significant way. In this regard, A. N. Sherwin White, a scholar of ancient Roman and Greek history at Oxford, has studied the rate at which legend accumulated in the ancient world. Using the writings of Herodotus as a test case, he argues that even a span of two generations is not sufficient for a legend to wipe out a solid core of historical facts. The picture of Jesus in the New Testament was established well within that length of time. Like the third fact, the fourth minimal fact is a conversion to Christianity of a skeptic, James. James, the brother of Jesus. John records that Jesus's brothers however you interpret brothers, did not believe in Jesus during his earthly ministry. For not even his brothers believed in him. Yet James became a believer. James was in the upper room. Why? James became a strong, influential leader of the church. Of the church in Jerusalem. And that early creed mentioned James as one who encountered the risen Jesus. Paul writes of his trip to Jerusalem. But I saw none of the other apostles except James, the Lord's brother. James's martyrdom is attested to by Josephus, Hegesippus, and Clement of Alexandria. And his conversion was so strong, the, the result of his conversion, the fruits of his conversion, or the works of his faith are so strong, it is listed as an indisputable minimal fact. Speaking of the Jerusalem church, no scholar denies that the Christian religion exploded, exploded out of first century Israel. Within one generation of the death of Christ, this movement known as the Way spread to Europe, Africa, and Asia. Christianity is an effect on the world that requires adequate explanation and cause. Unless you are totally checked out of reality and selfishly care only about the shallow, fleeting desires of the temporal flesh. Could be you. Used to be me. So where exactly did the Christian faith come from? And what best explains its origin? The most obvious answer to this question is that the disciples truly saw what they claimed to have seen that they saw the resurrected Jesus. Only an event of this magnitude could turn scared, scattered, skeptical disciples with no prior conception nor expectation of a crucified and risen Messiah into these bold, these courageous proclaimers of the gospel, willing to suffer and die for what they were proclaiming. This Jesus hath God raised up, whereof we all are witnesses. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made that same Jesus whom ye have crucified, both Lord and Christ. So the origin and the explosion of the Christian faith is best explained by the resurrection by the disciples' sincere belief that God rose Jesus from the dead. And anyone who denies this possibility must posit some other explanation. And there seems only to exist two possibilities. If the resurrection didn't happen, then Christianity was either the result of Jewish or pagan influence. It is terribly unlikely that this belief came from Jewish influence. The Jewish conception of resurrection was one final general resurrection of mankind or of the righteous occurring after the end of the world. Nowhere in Jewish thought do we find the idea of a single individual resurrecting within history never to die again. Hence why they hated him and hated his followers and were afraid of their teaching and had him killed and had them all killed. As for pagan influence, I think that calls for a separate video. Comment below. Okay, minimal fact five. Something happened to the body of Jesus. Not only was Jesus publicly executed in Jerusalem, 
but his post-mortem appearances and the empty tomb were first publicly proclaimed in Jerusalem. If Jesus was merely a man who lied, or a lunatic, perhaps, his body would have been found decaying in that tomb where they placed him, a tomb that was guarded. It would have been impossible or incredibly stupid to proclaim post-mortem appearances if all anyone had to do was go and check down the road. It would have been wholly un-Jewish, not to say foolish, to believe that a man was raised from the dead when his body was still in the grave. The Jewish authorities who had Jesus killed in the first place had plenty motivation and opportunity to produce the body of Jesus and silence his followers immediately. Christianity then would be a far distant memory. Had there been a body in the tomb, the religious leaders would have effectively ended Christianity before it began. But that's the thing. No one could produce a body because the body was gone. Something happened to the body of Jesus. The only early opposing theory recorded by the enemies of Christianity is that the disciples stole the body. A theory that's still making the rounds today as if it is at all compelling or even an adequate explanation. All four of the gospel narratives attest to Jesus being buried by Joseph of Arimathea, and they place women as the primary witnesses to the empty tomb. Both these details are highly unlikely to be the inventions of the early Christians who were Jewish. Atheist Geoffrey Lauder agrees that the burial of Jesus by Joseph of Arimathea has a high final probability. And second, just as likely to be invented, is that women were the first to discover the empty tomb. Considering the low social status of women in both Jewish and Roman cultures, and their inability to testify as a legal witness, if the empty tomb account was fabricated and intended to persuade skeptics, it would have been better, more convincing to say that some of the male disciples discovered the empty tomb. In other words, both accounts of the burial and the empty tomb demonstrate authenticity, which lends credibility to the gospel narratives. As is true of the crucifixion, the empty tomb meets the criteria of multiple independent and early eyewitness sources, including implicit enemy attestation, as well as the principle of embarrassment. It was embarrassing that the women were the ones to discover the empty tomb. Additionally, the reports of the burial and the empty tomb are simple. They lack theological or legendary development. Finally, there is no competing burial story in existence. Historian and skeptic Michael Grant concedes. The historian cannot justifiably deny the empty tomb, since applied historical criteria show the evidence is firm and plausible enough to necessitate the conclusion that the tomb was indeed found empty. Where'd the body go, man? Dude, where's my body? When inquiring about the historical event, the historian combs through the data. He considers all the possibilities, and he seeks to determine which scenario best explains the data. Some skeptics will argue that the resurrection cannot be investigated historically. Wrong. The meaning of the resurrection is theological, but the fact of the resurrection is a historical matter. Hence, Paul's words shared at the beginning of this video. The facts surrounding the resurrection are of a historical nature and can be investigated by anyone. Either the bodily resurrection of Jesus occurred in history or it didn't. Regardless, we cannot simply dismiss it as supernatural or miraculous in an attempt to remove it from the pool of potential explanations. We need to be careful, in other words, not to confuse the evidence for the resurrection with the best explanation of the evidence. The resurrection of Jesus is a miraculous explanation of the evidence, but the evidence itself is not miraculous. 
none of these four facts are in any way supernatural or miraculous. They are not inaccessible to the historian, nor are they inaccessible to you and me in this day and age. So although the resurrection rightly is classified as a miraculous event, it is a historical event nonetheless, and it should be investigated as such. The only way we can know whether an event can occur is to see whether, in fact, it has occurred. The problem of miracles, then, must be solved in the realm of historical investigation, not in the realm of philosophical speculation. And note that a historian, in facing an alleged miracle, is really facing nothing new. All historical events are unique, and the test of their factual character can be only the accepted documentary approach that we have followed here. No historian has the right to a closed system of natural causation. Therefore, whether or not Jesus rose from the dead is really quite straightforward. If Jesus was dead at point A and alive again at point B, resurrection occurred. The bodily resurrection of Jesus Christ is the best explanation for the data, for the known historical data. Jesus' resurrection fits the context of his life, vindicating his teachings and his radical claim to be the unique divine son of God. Paul says that Christ was declared with power to be the son of God by his resurrection from the dead. Naturalistic explanations, swoon theory, legendary development, fraud, hallucinations, these fail to account for all the relevant data, and in some cases are outright false and ahistorical. The resurrection hypothesis, however, accounts for all the known facts. It has greater explanatory scope and power, is more plausible and less ad hoc. Unless a person is guided by a prior commitment to philosophical naturalism. That is, any, any natural explanation is better than a supernatural or miraculous explanation. So unless a person has such a prior commitment, the conclusion that God raised Jesus from the dead is justified.